Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily. He's going to share with you a couple charts that are top of mind for him. We have the market overall in a bit of distribution mode. Morning to afternoon was two very different uh, feels to the market, sort of rallying out of the open uh, to uh, hit a peak around noon Eastern. The rest of the afternoon was more about distribution. The S&P finishing down about a third of a percent, but technology an outlier to the upside. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the message of the markets themselves. We focus on the information embedded in price and complementary to that in breadth and sentiment. My uh, uh, mentors early in my career reminded me or pointed out to me, stressed the value of looking at price. And arguably, all of that information, all of the investor psychology, all of the fear, the greed, the, the, uh, the desperation, the panic, the euphoria, the optimism is all embedded in price. And that a lot of mentors, Ralph Acampora, Jeff Weiss, even others like Phil Roth and others who would drive home the importance of price, but also looking at things like breadth and sentiment. I learned a lot from people like Phil Roth talking about breadth indicators, thinking about advanced decline lines and where a lot of times if you look under the hood, you can see a little more than if you're just, just looking at the price on its own. I think we're in one of those situations right now, arguably where the market continues to push higher. If you look purely at indications of price, seems very, very constructive. If we look under the hood at some of the breadth measures, which we've talked about recently, potentially less optimistic. And I think that is a, an issue that we need to grapple with right now as investors, as technical, uh, technically oriented uh, market participants. Now, we have great guests on this show. Today, I'm excited to talk to Larry Tentarelli. He always does a, such a great job. And I, I often joke that Larry brings charts I wish I would have found on my own. He always just tends to bring really good actionable charts. And I think that's one of the best uh, things we can do is, is look for actionable signals. Uh, later this week on Wednesday, we have Willie Delwich from All Star Charts. On Thursday, Chris Vermeulen from the Technical Traders. Coming up next week, we have Dale Pinkert joining us for the first time on Tuesday the 20th. Dale from Forex Analytics and then Ari Wald from Oppenheimer joining us on Wednesday the 21st. Also, two other quick notes. Uh, charting the second half is our mid-year market outlook happening all this week on Stock Charts TV. If you missed this show on Monday, uh, yesterday, the 12th, make sure you check that out because I sort of provided my own second half uh, preview. But we have uh, people like Martin Pring, Linda Rashke, Tony Dwyer, Gina Martin-Adams, and many more providing their insights uh, for what they're seeing for the second half of the year. So all this week on Stock Charts TV, go to stockcharts.com slash charting, the two ND half, charting the second half for more information. Also, I will be doing my next free webcast called the Market Top Checklist. I think we're in that one of those situations where the market has moved higher, but there are risks to downside and risk, risks of a corrective move. I'll show you, share with you the checklist that I would use to track the current market conditions and what things would need to be checked off to indicate a rotation from bull market to bear market phase. Go to marketmisbehavior.com slash market top if you're interested in signing up for that free event coming up on July 20th. Let's continue on with our market recap. We're going to start with a poll. This one I am very proud of Final Bar Nation for, for the most part, overwhelmingly answering correctly. The question was, what would Charles Dow, father of technical analysis, consider an uptrend? Almost all of you answered absolutely correctly. Higher highs and higher lows. I think selfishly, I, I will take partial credit because uh, in most shows, I tend to utter that phrase often <laughs> because I love to drive home just a very simple idea of following trend. And it's so funny, we get caught up in all the flickering ticks, all the different movements, all the different narratives, all the different thematic ideas. At the end of the day, I would argue trend following is about identifying trends and following them. And for that, focus on the highs and the lows. Are they getting higher? Are they getting lower? And uh, that alone will set you apart from, I think, many investors that forget to focus on those basic lessons of trend as uh, Charles Dow defined, defined them uh, over 100 years ago. So well done. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Stock Charts TV viewers, for answering that poll question almost all correctly. 
Let's continue on with our market recap. As I mentioned, it was sort of a, a tale of two markets today. The morning was about appreciation. The afternoon was more about giving those gains back and much more. We actually finished more toward the lows of Monday session. So if you think Friday accelerating into the close, Monday continuing to push higher through much of the trading day, today we actually gave back yesterday's gains and finished more toward the lows of the day. So the S&P down about a third of a percent, 0.35%. The NASDAQ about the same. The NASDAQ 100, however, was flat. And if you look at what's working right now in terms of what's not going down, technology, uh, the only sector uh, it looks at this point that finished in the uh, in the green today and the Nasdaq 100, which is really speaking to the strength in mega cap tech and communications names, uh, the, essentially flat for the day while the S&P was down about a third of a percent. The VIX, by the way, back higher above 17 to 1720 or so. Very quickly on other asset classes, a lot of movement in uh, the bond market. So the TLT was down about 0.8% and 10-year yields uh, back above 140. So currently around 142 or so. And this is quite a change. We were touching sort of the 120 region uh, not too long ago in recent weeks and now bouncing right back uh, higher. You know, sort of that uh, that idea that that um, uh, it, uh, that idea of interest rates and the 10-year yield being a key tell. Interesting today that you have rates going higher, you have financials actually closing lower, and you have technology going higher. And this is a great reminder. I think I think people love to oversimplify, and I'm probably as guilty of this as any. We love to oversimplify. If rates go up, what's going to happen to this sector, this group? And the base case would be higher 10-year yield should be great for financials and not as good for growth stocks. Today, you kind of had the opposite. You had rates finishing the day higher. You had financials down. You had technology up. Now, of course, there are a lot. It's not just that in a vacuum, right? Within technology, you have some of the mega cap, blue chippy defensive stuff like uh, you know the the fang stocks that people are parking in, uh, potentially guarding against some decline. So that's rising in a in a day when the market's down a little bit. Financials, you have earnings coming out. You had J.P. Morgan and uh, Goldman Sachs before the open today. You have some others through the remainder of this week, including some of the regional banks. Uh, and so that's certainly going to impact the uh, the sector as well. So rates higher today. The dollar also uh, higher with the UUP teasing at twenty five. Commodities overall, sort of a mixed message. Gold finishing up just a little bit above zero, but silver actually down. Oil prices higher. Energy, though, not really feeling the love from that and actually down on the day. Cryptocurrencies continuing their distributive uh, pattern. And let's go there next. Um, you know, when I'm looking at the chart of Bitcoin, I've been asked a lot about this in uh, from media outlets over, over recent weeks and, and really since the distribution began here April and really accelerated in May. You know, when, I, when I'm looking at this chart, the big red arrow at the bottom sort of gives you my base thesis on this chart. You know, I, are there reasons, uh, you know, not fundamentally, but philosophically why cryptocurrencies could go a lot higher? Of course, institutional adoption, regulatory pressures that are unfounded, um, the fact that there's just a broader interest, plenty of speculation that just, uh, you know, feeds on itself. All of those are reasons why cryptocurrencies could go uh, higher. However, when I'm looking at the chart, I'm seeing a pattern of weakening momentum. Even though you've had a bit of a bounce here in the last uh, two months or so, overall, literally every time that Bitcoin moves uh, to a uh, the, its next peak, the momentum is lower than the previous peak. And you can just see this, a stepwise downward motion um, through the course of 2021 until that pattern breaks, until you have some indication of increasing momentum and not decreasing momentum, I think the path of least resistance remains lower. What's interesting on the chart of Bitcoin is you sort of have a downtrend, but you're facing key support. So it's one of those charts that I think is very, uh, it's, at a, it's at a key decision point. Does 30,000 hold like it did in January, like it did in May, like it did in June? We continue to find support there and we uh, ride the next leg higher in, uh, in Bitcoin, or does that level finally fail and all of a sudden you have a much more distributive chart than we've seen? All of a sudden this looks like a big complex head and shoulders pattern or something like that, which measures a lot lower than, uh, than current levels. I think there's a potential for this to break down and, uh, and really you know, sort of lose its last floor that is obvious on this chart. And you're, starting to, you're gonna start to grasp for uh, what lower levels at, what, at which point buyers would come in. At that point, I think you look at momentum. I think you look at RSI, you look for indications of, uh, of, a, of a momentum reversal. But at this point, it certainly seems as if the path of least resistance remains, uh, remains negative there. Looking at a chart of the S&P 500, uh, you know, what, what is not in distribution mode by any uh, stretch of the imagination over the long-term timeframe is the S&P, right? This chart continues to make uh, new highs. This week already, we've made uh, a new uh, all-time high uh, intraday. So uh, today we actually uh, 
uh, got higher than, than yesterday's uh, record-breaking uh, high close. And so overall, you're seeing a pattern of higher highs over time. Every month, uh, the, uh, the S&P has managed to make a higher high than it did the previous month. A day like today is just one little distribution day among a big upward trend. And so, you know, previous pullbacks have been in the 4 to 6% range from the intraday high. That would put us right around the 50-day moving average if you got that from here. That's around 42.30, 42.25, uh, which is not too far uh, below where we're at, right? That's 100 and 150 points or so. Um, below there, I think the real levels are some of these previous support levels, right? The, the whole idea of higher highs and higher lows continues until it, until it doesn't. And so while it's reasonable to still be in a bullish configuration and have a pullback of 4 to 5%, that's totally fine. It's when that pullback doesn't hold. It's when the 50-day fails to hold, which really hasn't happened so far this year, right? You've had a, a close one day below it, and then you immediately close back above it the next day. That pattern would have to break to be a little less uh, uh, bullish here. Um, we'd have to fail at previous support levels. We'd have to undercut the low from June, which is around 41.70. We really have to undercut, undercut the low from May, which is around 40.50, 40.60. That would really indicate a dramatic shift from, uh, you know, from bullish phase to bearish phase. It's a long way from where we're at right now. There could be a lot of signal along the way, not necessarily from the chart of the S&P, but from um, some of the uh, stocks and sectors that comprise that index. I think that's where the breadth picture potentially turning negative could be very important. Stocks not able to hold their previous uh, support levels would be uh, would be very key as well. Let's check in on some of the stocks and groups that are on the move uh, this week. Uh, and very quickly, and then sorry, we have to wrap here. We're a little long on time here, but you know, two that I would mention very quickly. One is home builders. You know, we haven't talked about home builders a lot, and I think the fact that they're uh, very near to support from June is key. Uh, the ITB, which is one of the home builder ETFs, broke below the 50-day. Now tested the 50-day from below, and now potentially rolling over. We undercut that low. The RSI gets below 40. All of a sudden, this looks like a chart that's transitioned, much like the chart of Bitcoin, right, from an accumulation phase to a distribution phase. So I think that's an important one to watch uh, this week. JP Morgan's another one. So you had some of the big banks reporting this morning. You have others through the remainder of this week. These stocks need a catalyst to sort of resume their leadership role that they've sort of gotten away from. On the chart of JP Morgan and others, you have clear support levels. And so looking at the lows from April and June could be really key for some of these charts this week. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my guest, Larry Tenterelli. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. Two quick announcements, and then we'll get on with our guest, Larry Tentarelli. Number one, uh, we love to hear from you. We're going to do another mailbag segment a little later in today's show. Shoot us any questions that come up as you're analyzing your own charts. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We are on Twitter at Final Bar uh, SCTV. Finally, on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to hear from you and answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment at the end of this week. Also, as a reminder, go to StockChartsTV.com. Use your email, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our great content, our fantastic group of hosts, fantastic guests like Larry Tentarelli and others, all on demand. Go to StockChartsTV.com or search on any of the app stores for StockCharts TV on demand. I want to welcome on my guest, Larry Tentarelli, joining us once again on the show. Larry comes to us from New England. He's the founder of Blue Chip Daily. Always does a fantastic job breaking down the charts. Larry, welcome back to the show. Good afternoon, David. Thank you for having me on. So as always, you bring a couple charts with you, and, uh, and I appreciate how you make us all think. We're starting in sort of the growth area of the market. Looking at Facebook, what are you seeing? What I, it's, it's interesting. What I see with Facebook is exactly what you spoke about before as far as the classic definition of an uptrend. So if you take a look, Facebook broke out in at the end of March, beginning of April, and you can see it, it's made a series of higher highs, series of higher lows and trading above that rising 50 day moving average. So the, the key factor for me was that big breakout over 305 in the beginning of April, 
small consolidation down to 296, and then it's just been straight up since then, and that's a very constructive uptrend for me. And it's interesting. It's just it's the sometimes it's the most simple views of this. I mean, just seeing uh, you know a price above a series of upward sloping moving averages. How bad can this chart be in that sort of configuration, right? Sure. I mean, it's just and and it's funny when you describe the classic definition of an uptrend. The uh, the Facebook chart came to mind. The Google chart came to mind. But I'm seeing a lot of these mega cap charts that that have broken out. And have just gone in, into you know basically a lower volatility uptrends, which is where mm -hmm. I want to be. And it's certainly you know those those types of names doing that sort of pattern is certainly going to help the overall uh, averages moving higher. Chart number two is getting more to the payment processors. Talk us through the chart of Shopify. Now Shopify, it, it's a little bit more volatile. It's a little bit higher beta. The the key breakout level, the first one that I see on the screen, is thirteen hundred in the beginning of June when it started to break out of that range. And then it went on a pretty sharp move up to 1552. And then it's just started to consolidate over the past two or three weeks. But if you take a look, it's been basically a lower volume consolidation. And it's held most of that breakout level right into the 20 day moving average. The 50 day is turned up, the 200 day is turned up. And, and what I see with Shopify, is I think the beginning of a, a breakout and another major leg higher. Two really good charts, Larry. I'd love, we've got time for a question or two. You know, when you're, when we're talking about the market and I, and I know if I remember right, I know you're not as, as big as looking at the, at the major averages and, and thinking about price levels or anything, but when you're looking at the stock level, you know, this week in particular, we have a lot of the financials reporting, right? We have JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, we've got a lot of the other, uh, you know, banks coming through the course of the week. So a pivotal earnings season, the charts overall, you know, if we're looking for higher highs and higher lows, we're arguably not necessarily in that moment. We're sort of range bound. Do you see opportunities in charts like this that have had a bit of a pullback that, that were leadership and are starting to take a break? Or is it really more the time to focus on the growth names that are that are moving higher here? What, what I think for now, and I follow the banks pretty closely, but what I think for now with, with the banks, JP Morgan, Bank of America, I think they still need to prove themselves. Now they have put in a higher low versus the recent lows in June in both cases. Now, the earnings weren't particularly well received today. Goldman Sachs has been a little bit more of a focus name in the banks and brokers, uh, but their earnings weren't as well received either. Really, in financials, American Express has been the chart that I've been most focused on on the website. And you can see that that's a much more steady uptrend, high, higher highs, higher lows. And I think not as interest rate sensitive as maybe the banks and brokers are. So AXP is the top uptrend in the financials for me. You do tend to find some really consistent trends. I'm not surprised when I throw a couple of financials at you, you managed to find, I was thinking it was going to be American Express, like a Moody's or something, right? MCO in these, in these nice consistent uptrends, but there certainly seems to be some opportunities outside of the larger banks, I guess. And, and I've got the banks, I've got Bank of America and Goldman squarely on my potential buy list, but I'd, I'd like to see them get a little bit stronger first. We only have about 30 seconds left, Larry, but I'd love, you know, so overall, charts seem constructive. You highlighted two names, Facebook and Shopify, that are in pretty good upward phases. What would you see that would start to make you feel a little less optimistic? Is it stocks like Facebook sort of ending that uptrend? Is it, you know, things like the banks breaking down as opposed to being sideways? What, what would you be looking for that would make you feel a little less uh, or a little more cautious about the overall environment here? I think if they started to make a lower low or if the S&P broke below 4,050, the, the growth stocks have disconnected from the cyclicals for now. But on, on the S&P, 4,050 is my key trend level. So as long as we stay above that, I think it's a constructive uptrend overall. Larry, it's always such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for what you're doing. And, uh, and as always, thanks for being uh, way more than, uh, than uh, generous on social media, providing ideas to everyone around. Be safe, be well, uh, take care of yourself, all right? Dave, thank you very much. Have a great day. That's Larry Tentarelli. Larry, Larry's the founder of uh, Blue Chip Daily, coming to us from, uh, from New England. Uh, he, he does a fantastic job. If you've not followed him on social media, I encourage you to, to look him up on, on Twitter. He does a great job and shares a lot of charts and, uh, and, and thoughts. You know, it's interesting. I, I think he laid out a beautiful, uh, you know, series of charts that are just in good uptrends. And it reminds me of 
the logic, I mean, one set of thinking is it's a macro call, right? Focus on the overall market conditions and then pick stocks that express, express your macro view. Talking to people like Larry reminds me to just focus on trends that are working, right? In, in a particular sector like financials, something like an American, an American Express is in a decent uptrend. Focus on the charts that are in good uptrends and uh, as opposed to uh, sticking with ones that are not. Great take from Larry Tentarelli. Our next segment today is the final bar mailbag. As I've mentioned many times, we love hearing from you, love making this an interactive discussion on the markets and on technical analysis and market dynamics, on investor psychology, whatever you want to throw at us, we're happy to point you in the right direction as much as we can. Question number one, can you compare the chart of SQM with these two different timeframes and comment on the different outcomes? Uh, I'll give it a shot. So you sent two charts and thank you so much. I will be completely honest with you. I am not familiar with SQM. I believe it's a Mexican name, but I really don't know. So I'm I'm doing a pure technical view just on what I'm seeing with the chart. You sent two charts. One is a like a two and a half year uh, weekly chart. The other one looks like a one year weekly chart, maybe or maybe a little bit more than that. But but I think you're sort of highlighting these two different time frames. You know. So and and again, this is your chart that we're that we're looking at. But you know, overall, what I think is interesting about a chart like this. Is you know we think about my conversation with uh, with Larry just now. You know I, I think to me on my technical checklist the very first thing is the trend. Right? Is this chart making higher highs and higher lows, or lower highs and lower lows, or some combination? Answer that question first, and then you can fill in the blanks with everything else. What I'm seeing with this uh, stock in particular is a rotation from a distribution phase of lower highs and lower lows to a bit of an accumulation phase of higher highs. And higher lows. I think making a higher swing high there in mid June was encouraging. Making a new swing high, getting a back moving average resistance, uh, is encouraging as well. And overall, uh, certainly seems to be positive. You you have the PPO on the bottom, which is sort of a classic trend following mechanism. So very close to a buy signal there on the weekly chart. It'd be interesting to see uh, if you get some sort of rotation uh, higher there. Uh, your daily, you know, the, your second chart is is still more weekly. Here we're looking at the relative strength of this stock versus the S&P and on a relative basis certainly has not been impressive. And, and the reason why this is happening is because this is a stock that's in pullback mode uh, while you know big mega cap growth stocks in the US are, are performing very well and that's keeping the indexes high. So I'm not surprised it's been underperforming a little bit. You'd certainly like to see the relative strength uh, go higher. You know, the, the indicator you have at the bottom is a stochastics RSI, and it's a five uh, bar period. So looking at the weekly data, this is not an indicator I use, although I'm, I'm very familiar with this is much more of a short term mean reversion kind of indicator. So it's giving sort of a an, a, uh, a a bullish sign and that the, the trend, the short term momentum has been very strong. If you look back at when you had had similar patterns like this, this has been, uh, you know, impulse moves over the last year. So I would bucket that more in the encouraging category that you're seeing upward moves that are causing this to uh, to move this indicator up to the uh, to the upper end. So overall, it appears to be a constructive chart based on my read. Again, I don't know anything about the company, so I can't comment anything beyond uh, beyond that. What I love in your question is the implication that you want to do uh, different timeframes. What I would suggest is make the second chart a daily chart. If you really want to understand the um the last uh, the last uh, uh, you know most recent period. If you're looking at a one year period, I think a daily uh, data and I have no idea where this came from. That's an interesting one. Um, but if if you have a daily view, you can uh, you can basically uh, get the uh, get the short term sense of what's happening uh, better than on the weekly data. This sort of time frame, I look at daily data instead of weekly data. But that's the only suggestion I would make for you. Great question. Question number two, there was a great show over the weekend with Bruce Frazier and Andrew Cardwell discussing RSI regimes and bullish percent index. I'm thinking that in determining strength of a sector, you can look at the last low in RSI should be greater or, than or equal than 40, and the last low in the bullish percent index should be greater than 50. Um, that's part of your question. I'll, I'll comment on that very quickly. Um, yeah, I was actually doing a webcast with, um, boy, who was I just talking to? Um, the Market Huddle uh, podcast. We just did an interview um, uh, last week for that, and we were talking about uh, you know the uh, bullish percent indexes. We actually went into uh, Pat Ceresna, by the way, was his name. Uh, we we uh, Pat was on my show, and and then I went on his uh, his podcast, which should be out shortly. And we looked at this chart among many others, which was looking at the bullish percent index on particular sectors. And this, by the way, the bullish percent indexes for the different sectors, which you can find on our market um, summary page. Uh, does a great job of indicating the cyclical rotation of some of these uh, breadth indicators. And your comment was keeping the bullish percent, percent index above 50, which would mean at least 50% of that 
index or that sector are in a positive point and figure chart, the RSI remaining above 40. And that makes a ton of sense. That's sort of the base case we tend to talk about with uh, with RSI. You can see on the chart of the S&P going back for the last year, pretty much when there's been a pullback, especially year to date, you can see we've been at or above 40. And that's more classic of a bull market phase. And Andrew Cardwell, by the way, has done more than, than anyone talking about RSI and how to think about some of those ranges uh, for something uh, for something like that. So I, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's a, a decent way to think about the relationship between momentum and breadth. You did it actually in your question say, these are bullish percent index readings for the cap weighted sector, but not equal weighted. I'd, I'd just let you know, remember that the bullish percent indexes are not weighted at all. They're actually equal weighted indexes. So even though you're looking at the financial sector, those uh, bullish percent indexes are always equal weighted, similar to an advanced decline line. It's not weighting those stocks by anything else. So that's actually doing what you, uh, what you would hope it would already. Boy, finally, and then we got to wrap the show here. Wanted to ask about your trend line that you use on your daily chart of the S&P. Um, you know, I'm using the log scale chart. If you connect the November low and the March 2021 low, we're sort of right there. Your comment is, if we use a, um, not a log scale, but an arithmetic scale, then we never break the trend line at any point. The S&P looks even more bullish. So I will call a major league chart crime. If you look at the S&P over the last year and do not use a log scale, um, and I don't blame you because if you're looking at short term time frames in arithmetic scale where you have an equal distance based on price, which is sort of the standard way you probably think a chart should be, it makes sense on a shorter term time frame. On a longer term time frame, though, what log scale does is, an, is, is the vertical distance is based on equal percent moves, not on equal dollar moves. You can see when it's 300 to 3100, there's a certain distance, but 4,000 to 4,100 is a smaller distance because it's a smaller percent. And if you're looking at long-term trend lines, you really need to do it on log scale. At, at Fidelity in my former life, the chairman of Fidelity would come through with a fine tooth comb. And if he saw any charts in that room that were not log scale, he would call them out and we'd have to fix it immediately because he was so adamant about the importance of log scale. That makes your, your chart represent the percent moves much more effectively. So yes, it, on, a, on, a, on an arithmetic chart, the price is going to be up here, but I think that falsely shows an acceleration in the trend, which is not really the case. You really want to do it on a semi-log scale, which is what we show here. Great questions, all of those. I hope my answers uh, help point you in the right direction or help address some of your own questions. We need to wrap the show today. Go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is small caps versus large caps, IWM over the SPY. My comment or my conversation with Larry Tentorelli, we talked about the leadership or the strength in some of the FANG stocks. He highlighted Facebook as a great example of a consistent uptrend. I don't disagree. Uh, I will tell you the, the indexes themselves look artificially strong. And I don't mean artificial because it is an accurate calculation. It's just the problem is when you have the market going higher and it's a smaller number of mega cap names propelling it higher, it doesn't make me feel as comfortable about the overall market conditions. I think the breadth lines in terms of the cumulative advanced decline lines breaking down is one uh, bullet point that's concerning. I would say the underperformance of small caps is also concerning as well. Can the market go higher without small caps outperforming? Of course, and look from mid-March till today, the market's made new highs while this ratio has been going down. But overall, I would feel much more comfortable about the overall market conditions if that ratio was going higher rather than lower. Chart number two is Boeing. We talked about some of the financial stocks that are testing support, potentially rolling over. Things like Goldman or JP Morgan, JP Morgan come to mind. Uh, we talked about the chart of Apple, which had this beautiful symmetrical triangle and actually broke out to the upside. Boeing right now is actually making a similar symmetrical triangle to the chart of Apple. Apple resolved this to the upside in the last month. Boeing has a potential to resolve this symmetrical triangle to the downside. I think that could be a concerning breakdown in a key industrial name. I think breaking out down through that pattern would be problem number one. Breaking below price support here in May would be problem number two. That would probably take us below the 200-day moving average, which would indicate a real uh, potential for further decline. Finally, the chart of Bitcoin, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the market recap, I think overall the long-term trend is fairly negative. On the hourly chart, we have a potential to bounce higher. And I think taking a trend line from some of the recent uh, highs, especially with something like cryptocurrencies, which are a little more volatile, and see if we're able to break above there for a short-term bounce could be really interesting. But until we break that, I think the tactical as well as the longer term, still more negative. Folks, that is our show for today. Special thank you to Larry Tantarelli joining us from New England, sharing his thoughts for StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, guys. Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, 
hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.